Bonjour and good morning. My name is Victor. Uh, I'm from a company called Cosmonic, and I'm here to talk to you about extending Backstage with plugins built with uh, WebAssembly. Um, before we get started, real quick, uh, I'd love to do the show of hands. Uh, who here has heard of WebAssembly? All right, so for people maybe watching online, that's like half, maybe half the people in the room are kind of sparse here. Uh, but okay, I'll, I'll keep going. So <laughs> in case you're very, very lost and somehow ended up in this room and don't know what Backstage is, uh, so, so I, I kind of think of Backstage this way. Uh, you get to write code, right? You click some buttons uh, somewhere, right? Computers get hot, your code goes up, you pay some more cloud bills, uh, and hopefully your customers, you know, they do better, right? And, uh, and Backstage makes this really easy, whereas people would, uh, prior to now, sort of cobbled this together with lots of other scripts and uh, sort of, you know, GitHub Actions and, uh, and Travis CI if you're still there. Uh, so why are, we, why are we here, right? Uh, this talk, uh, I want to introduce a bit of experimenting we've been doing around backstage and making DevOps easier uh, and trying to expand the plugins that are available for the backstage ecosystem. So right now, uh, backstage is essentially a large JavaScript app, and to extend Backstage, you need to write JavaScript, right? Just for both front-end and back-end plugins, they sort of work all the same way. Uh, also, don't worry, these, these slides are a bit text-heavy, and they'll be available after. Uh, there'll be a QR code and, and a link for, for, for folks to look at. Uh, they're also on Sketch, so uh, you can check them out there. Uh, but yeah, so, the, so the, the main point here is really that we want to enable developers who don't write JavaScript to write uh, extensions to Backstage. Uh, when when the, the, the problem of building a plugin ecosystem is pretty large, right? There are lots of ways you can do it. Uh, Backstage is a JavaScript, right? It's a JavaScript application, so some of the more native options is stuff like V8 isolates. Um, there's always the, the, the general sort of approach of virtual machines, which give you good safety, right? That's they're basically the, the gold standard on, on isolation that we have available. Uh, and then there's, there are approaches like a sort of microservice-based approach, where you could, you know, theoretically do an iframe in the application and then, you know, push that off to a microservice and then have, uh, have backend calls also go, go there. Uh, and the reason I want to add assembly, WebAssembly to this list is, is it, it actually has a lot of uh, features and benefits from the top three and is a lot easier to deploy now with some of the changes that are coming in the ecosystem. So I'm gonna I'm gonna run through very quickly what Web WebAssembly is. Uh, it's it's deep, but this should be mostly all you need to know. So the TLDR on WebAssembly that, that should take you very far is that it's a compile target, right? So you write C code, you get native code out, right? It works on one platform, works on one stack, sometimes even specific hardware, and then you we we uh, switch to something like Java, and what you do is you ship the thing that runs the code, right? You, you sort of compile bytecode, and that's what you get out. But you need the JVM, you need the JRE, right? Uh, Python code is, is pretty much the same thing. Uh, WebAssembly is like uh, Java or like Python in that you write code uh, that compiles down to WebAssembly. Uh, what you see here is the WebAssembly textual format, but there is obviously also a binary format. So we generally just think of these as WebAssembly binaries. Uh, this, you can think of, the, if you've been around long enough, you can think of this as the promise of Java, but it actually works uh, in multiple places, uh, more places than Java. Uh, so this is a, a bit of a conceptualization of the, of the uh, concept we just talked about. There's lots of ways to compile, right? There's lots of ways to build the thing you're going to ship if you're building a native binary. But what uh, WebAssembly does is it gives you a sort of intermediate uh, binary to ship as long as you have a WebAssembly compliant runtime. Uh, over there on the right, uh, and you can run it from all these different languages. Uh, and these are actually the languages that are best supported right now. So you've got C, uh, C++ is there, uh, and this is really via Clang, so this is really um, taking advantage of that tool chain. Uh, you've got Rust, you've got Go, C Sharp, uh, Python, and JavaScript. Also TypeScript, obviously, which um, transpiles down. And right now, the WASM runtimes that exist out there have really good support for many uh, upcoming, and actually RISC-5 risk, risk, uh, risk is not on here, but um, there's sort of support uh, burgeoning for that as well. So lots of architectures are supported, uh, and it's, it's pretty easy to, uh, to deploy at this point. So why, uh, if you remember going back a couple of slides, there's all these options, there's isolates, there's virtual machines, uh, there's you know, microservices, right? Why is WebAssembly a good fit? 
Well, so it's sandboxed. It's, it's, it's well sandboxed. You generally have to give uh, permissions to do any sort of operation. Like, you don't get, by default, access to the file system. Uh, it's performant. Uh, so this is actually the, I, I, I went to go look for the most critical sort of piece of research uh, on how fast WebAssembly is compared to running natively, right? And natively means a lot of things, but in this case, I'm, I'm thinking just think C, right? Think as, you know, uh, <laughs> unsafe, <laughs> close to assembly language stuff. Uh, and WebAssembly generally runs very quickly. Uh, it's, you know, built for browsers and built, in, and built to work in what could be low, low performance and, and, and low capability environments. Uh, and, and I've put there for reference, Python is, is very, very slow compared to, compared to native code. So it really depends on what you measure to, uh, but, but it's generally very performant. Uh, WebAssembly is also cross-platform. So I've covered this a little bit earlier, uh, but the support for platforms is pretty good, uh, and even emerging stuff like you know, RISC-5 and, and stuff that's coming up. Uh, of course, this is all um, spec'd out. It's community-driven, uh, and it's standards-driven. So you can go to WebAssembly.org, look at the docs, learn more about the security, isolation, performance, uh, and the platforms uh, that it targets. Uh, going back to the, uh, so, so out of the WebAssembly detour, and back to the, the point of the talk, which is talking about how we can extend Backstage with plugins that are written in you know, non-JavaScript languages. Uh, we actually went ahead and tried to build this. Uh, and well, we succeeded, which is why I'm here. Uh, and as you know, there are two kinds of Backstages, uh, Backstage plugins nominally. There is front end uh, and back end plugins. And so they work very, very similarly, but just slightly differently. Uh, first thing we need to do is to create uh, an interface on the, and this is a sort of WebAssembly specific concept. I'll, I'll introduce it a bit more, but you can think of this kind of like gRPC if you've heard of that. Uh, and then what we provide is a CLI that builds and installs this plugin, right? So you write uh, essentially a WebAssembly binary, you run the CLI, and what you get out the other end is a fully built, and again, JavaScript compatible uh, backstage plugin. Uh, and for backend plugins, they're a little bit different, right? Because they're, they're basically web servers that live alongside Backstage. Uh, so so they're, they're, they're a little bit different, but, the, but the, the shell is the same. We need an interface that sort of describes what a uh, backend plugin is, uh, and a CLI that uh, builds it and serves the request using the WASM binary that you gave it. So uh, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot to uh, this slide, even though it looks very simple. Uh, WebAssembly interface types are a standard that builds upon the base WebAssembly standards that let you sort of speak in high-level concepts like strings and functions and uh, sort of more easy to understand types to the average, average developer. Because at its, at its core, WebAssembly can actually only deal in sort of computations on numbers. Right? So like you see those there, you've got like, you know, signed 32-bit integers and, and things like that. Um, but with WebAssembly types, uh, the WebAssembly interface types, which I'll be calling WIT from now on. So if you hear WIT, you're going to hear WIT a lot. Uh, but that's what it means. And, and basically, uh, you see a, a simple logging interface there, right? So up at the beginning, you've got the package. Uh, and the first, first bit of that is a namespace, and the second bit is, uh, is a package name. You've got an interface here, which is a basic logging sort of uh, uh, interface. And it's only got one function in it, right? It's got log. It takes a string, and it actually doesn't give anything back. It does something with that string uh, that logs it, hopefully, somewhere, right? Um, and the thing at the bottom there is the world, which tells us the sort of interface to the binary. So this means that this, the binary that fits this interface exports, so lets you call on it. Uh, this logging interface. So other things can call log uh, on this binary, right? And so this is kind of like a binary level uh, interface language or interface description language, which is why it's sort of similar to, uh, to gRPC. One thing I do want to note uh, to, to prevent confusion is that this interface language is not over the network. So this is inside your binary, inside your program, uh, at function call speeds, right? This is not, you know, uh, by default going over the network and, and incurring, you know, <laughs> JSON serialization uh, penalties. So this is that previous slide, but uh, but illustrate it a little bit to make it make it a bit easier to understand. So you've got your program sort of at the outside, uh, and you've got 
your WebAssembly runtime, there's, there's many of them at this point, but the one that's kind of keeping up with the standards and, and helping to test out the standards is called Wasm time. So inside your program, you've got a WebAssembly runtime in there, uh, and you've got a component that's written in, let's say, one that's written in Rust, and another one that's written in Go, and the way they can interact with each other or with the, um, with the runtime itself when you execute them uh, is by this import and export system. So I'll, I'll go back a little bit. Sort of the export that's here is sort of the, uh, the export that's, uh, the export that's pictured here. And then there's another component that, that is, is built specifically to match that export. And so they sort of connect together. All right, so you, you don't, don't try and read this, uh, but this is basically the entire specification a, a, as we've built it so far for what a backstage front end plugin is. So unfortunately, I can't save you from writing React code and having to, uh, having to write that in your backstage front end plugins. But um, we can sort of formalize some of these ideas around dependencies and which files are sort of bundled right, in the, uh, in the front, end, fr uh, front end plugin. Sort of what does is, what is a front end plugin sort of consist of? Uh, this is useful in and of itself because um, especially in the previous talk, uh, we had some questions around how can you sort of make it make a concrete requirement on what people produce as plugins. And this is, this is sort of a way you can do that, because the uh, WebAssembly binary that comes out of this, um, you can sort of introspect it, right? You can ask it about itself. And it, of course, you know, th there can, it can lie. But, uh, but in general, you, you have some, uh, some leverage there. Uh, so I'm going to dive just real quick into what this looks like in regular Rust code. I'm going to take a step back. How many people are familiar with Rust and its sort of tool chain and uh, have touched it? All right. Well, uh, for, for reference, that's like four people out of this entire room. Uh, so we're going to go through this very quickly, actually. Uh, <laughs> most of this is just normal, just normal Rust config. Like, uh, none of it is, is unique. Uh, and this is Toml, for those who, who, who aren't familiar. Uh, but the two things that are important and sort of WebAssembly specific here are the specification that the, uh, the crate type, which is uh, sort of like a package type in Rust, in Rust speak, uh, is a dynamic library. Uh, and the dependencies is, are, are is, is, there's only one really dependency we need here, which is a project that helps to turn wit definitions, so what, what I showed you earlier, into code. So similar to a gRPC generator, or any other kind of like, you know, let's say an open a API generator, uh, that's what WitBindGen is doing for us here. Um, and then down at the bottom is actually, it's actually optional, but what, I, what I'm telling Russ there is that the target um, and essentially what it should build to is WASM32 WASI, which is just a, a sort of target triple name for WebAssembly with WASI enabled. I'll get to what WASI is later, but we're not going to go too deep because it is deep. Um, for those who don't, who don't know Rust, which is everybody except for four people, uh, this is probably not going to be much, but this is the, what you see at the top there is a generated file. So that's so, some of the output of that, of that generator I mentioned earlier. Uh, and what you see below are actually some of the types that we defined uh, way back in the WIT definition. So if I just go back uh, really quickly, oh, right here. So it's a bit hard to read, but the, uh, the node dependency is kind of like an object, right, that I've just defined there. It is called a record on there. But it's got three attributes or three members, let's say. Name, version, and whether it's a development uh, dependency. So we see that, that, that sort of comes, uh, that gets generated and shows up in our, we can use it from our code. So you see it as the sort of third import there. Um, and then the struct that's a little bit to the, to a little bit below here is like a, it's like a class, you can give it a class, but without uh, functionality, right? So um, just, just data in it. But what we are going to do is hang functionality off of it. Uh, so for the, for the Rust side, when we specify the node develop, uh, dependencies, which is one of the requirements, um, the code generally looks like this. It's, it might be a bit hard to read if you're, if you're not, a, not a Rust station, but it's, it, it's, very, it's very simple. If you look at the area right around the middle here where we just make a, a, a uh, a vector of node dependency objects, we see that, oh, we've got a dependency and it's, it's called React, right? Of course we do, because it's, it's a front-end uh, front plugin at the end of the day. Uh, and, and so that's, that's basically what the, the general code ends up looking like. It's, it's sort of implementations of this interface that we said we were going to fulfill. 
right? The, the WIT interface. And I'll skip over this, but uh, it's sort of, you can sort of recognize it if you, you, you squint a little bit. You see some, some TSX files and, and some component names. Uh, and, and sort of specifying this is us fulfilling this contract, again, at the binary level, right? Uh, so now I'm going to jump into a little demo of the front end building um, and build a backstage plugin really quick here. All right, I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Hopefully, you all can see this. OK, that looks uh, reasonably legible. Let's see. OK, so here's, uh, here's that code I, I mentioned before. Maybe a bit more legible than before. Um, and as you can see, it's sort of just a list of these node dependency objects, right? And sort of things you might recognize. You've got backstage core components. Uh, you've got some component files in here. Uh, and this build is pretty slow, so I'm going I'm to kick it off. But first, we're going to do is this is Rust code. We're going to build this Rust code, and then we're going to run the CLI uh, that, that we've, been, uh, we've been working on here to, uh, to generate uh, a backstage plugin. So this is, this is built pretty quick, because I've built it before this talk, of course. Uh, and this is, uh, again, uh, environment or, and, and tool chain specific, right? So Cargan component is the thing that works for Rust. Uh, and for Python and for JavaScript, you'll have different tools. But generally, the, the first step is to build your code into a WebAssembly binary, right? And, and that's what I've just done there. So now I'm going to run, with a little pre-prepared uh, command I have here, the uh, CLI that we've been working on. So, you can see here that um, we are generating this sort of front end plugin. Um, we've, it, we've given it an ID, which is kind of a name like thing. We've got a path to the binary. And then what actually we also do is install the created plugin into a local, you know, wherever your uh, backstage directory is on disk. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick that off. This does take a little bit of time. So we'll, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't think we'll we'll see how the uh, how the Wi-Fi holds up here. All right. While that runs, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump back here because the uh, the front end is very similar. So I'll uh, I'll let that run. OK, uh, sorry, the back end is very similar. Uh, so here we basically go into the back end, and it's a repeat of the previous slides because in, in actuality, the interface is even smaller for a back, back, end, uh, a back end plugin. But the interface is a lot more interesting. So towards the, the bottom, it's a bit hard to read, but there's a export that we haven't seen up until now called WASI HTTP. Now, I'm going to explain WASI very quickly. Um, and what it is, it's a standard that builds on the original WebAssembly standards to encapsulate the functionality uh, that lets you serve web requests. So doing things like making web requests and serving web requests. So we've worked basically all the way up from just doing numbers and addition and subtraction to performing web requests, passing strings around, doing all of this. Uh, and, and this is uh, one of the standards that makes that happen and makes it really, really easy. So, we sort of start like at the top, right? We start with numbers, and we add on interface types, and they, they give us interfaces at the binary level. Uh, and then we add on WASI, and now we have reusable functionality, right? We have 
at the binary level, at the, at the WebAssembly binary level, we have reusable functionality that is sort of a high level and abstracted. Uh, this is also all developed in the open, right? So if you wanted to look up WASI HTTP and find out what was in it, find out how it was specified, uh, you could actually just you know, go to GitHub. It's on there. Um, <laughs> breaking changes show up there. You know, changes that don't break things show up there. Uh, and it's easy to, uh, easy to sort of look through and, and verify and grok for yourself. Uh, let's check on that, uh, that build there. See if it's done. Oh, OK. So the Backstage plugin has built at this point. If you, if you like seeing terminal output, there's, there's some there for you. Oh, OK, actually, so there's, <laughs> you've got the, uh, the last yarn install. So 90% of the time that this, uh, this CLI takes is, is running yarn. Uh, and, and because I do a, a sort of from scratch install uh, to keep things sort of hermetic. Uh, we'll, we'll wait for this to finish and load it into our, uh, our backstage instance, which is, over, which is over here. Let's do this. So going through some of this, um, it basically does some templating. Uh, it takes the, takes the WASM binary that I built before and um, also changes your app.tsx. Uh, one thing I'd, I'd love to note about this is that we generally want to try and find a better way to integrate that doesn't require sort of string manipulation in, uh, in these files, but, you know, we're not there yet. Uh, all right, so now it's finished. Let's, uh, let's boot up uh, backstage here. Uh, one thing before I do. Uh, so this, this is kind of a list of changes uh, that have sort of happened, right, as a result. These are the changes that got written into the backstage instance uh, as a result of running that earlier CLI command. So you can see we've sort of modified the package.json. We've, you know, messed with the dependencies a little bit. We've got uh, the app uh, file, the TSX file that we've changed, and then we've got a new plugin directory, right? Okay, and soon we'll have just the you sort of standard, you know, backstage uh, backstage setup here. Uh, and the ID of the plugin uh, was example front end, example dash, you know, hyphen front end. So if we go there, we'll be able to, uh, we should be able to see it. We should be able to see our, uh, what we've developed here. And that's it. <laughs> so basically what's happened is we've built, we've taken some time to build a uh, WebAssembly binary in Rust, um, generate essentially from that binary alone uh, a backstage plugin and load it into an active backstage instance. Uh, again, front end plugins just end up being, you know, React apps. So, so that's what we're seeing, we're seeing here. Okay. Yeah, so getting back here, um, again, this is all developed in the open, easy to find if you just, you know, do a little searching. I'm going to zoom straight through this because this is very similar to what you saw for the front end, uh, but just back end tailored, right? And again, it's, it's at the binary level implementing the interface you said you would. Uh, there's also, uh, I'll also do a quick demo of the back end because um, the back, ends, the back end uh, plugins are actually, a, to me, a bit more important because they open up your backstage instance to other services that you might be running and other orchestration systems. So they're a bit richer, I think, in terms of uh, integration capability. So here's that, uh, here's that code. It's considerably more complicated, mostly because of uh, the WASI HTTP integration. So the way WASI HTTP is written is essentially as basically as robust as you can ask for uh, something that deals with web requests, um, just because it needs to cover many, many uh, types, of, types of things. Uh, this is the uh, endpoint we're going to hit later, so you can, you can, you can see it there. Hopefully, hopefully we'll, get to, we'll get to execute that bit of code. Uh, and yeah, I'm going I'm to go ahead and kick off the process at the bottom here.
Again, execution very similar to before, and unfortunately going to take a similarly long amount of time. Uh, but it's you specify the plugin type, specify where you'd like to where you'd like to build, and where your backstage uh, installation is, and it will it will go ahead and put it in the right place. Let me. Uh, All right, and what I've done there is just put the uh, backstage instance back to sort of default. All right, and uh, while that's while that's building, we'll uh, we'll keep chugging at home, chugging along here. Uh, so we've got a thing that works. Uh, well, I haven't proven the second part works yet, but at least some of it works. Uh, and so what what do we what what's left, right? <laughs> well, there's a lot left, and what we really want to do is improve these areas that. Uh, that we feel sort of hurt the, the UX of, like, if, if this is ever going to work, we need better UX than, than the current, right? We need better UX than just writing JavaScript and running it that way. Uh, and right now, what we, what we want to do is make this loop a little faster, uh, maybe try and get a tighter integration, but it, it opens up a sort of a harder question, right? Which is, can you, in a more general sense, convert any given React component to WebAssembly in a reasonable way that anyone will understand, right? It, then someone that doesn't have, you know, doesn't have to be a, a, a front-end developer to understand. Uh, there are frameworks that do this, um, like there are frameworks on the, you know, the Python side or the Rust side that you can spit out essentially HTML and DOM elements. Um, so, so it's possible, but this is something we we, we need to look into more and uh, build a good UX around. Also, there is, uh, oh, rather than uh, sorry. Rather than using, uh, changing the files by just looking for strings, uh, it just makes a lot more sense to do a, a smarter, smarter manipulation of the backstage code. Uh, and sort of, I think a lot of that would enable more programmatic editing of a backstage instance, which I, I assume that Rody has down, uh, but, but uh, would definitely help the ecosystem, we think. Uh, and of course, there's wiring it of more of backstage re uh, resources, like uh, authentication and the database. Uh, and I, I wanted to note here that that actually means writing more wit. Right? So that just means formalizing the interface uh, and then wiring things up to sort of make the interface available at runtime to the WebAssembly binary. So generally, what, what can you build right, with this? Well, we'd like people to build front end and back end plugins with this toolkit and help us find the sharp edges, help us find, us, find things that don't work and could be better. Uh, and, and right now, as far as WebAssembly goes, these languages are the best, right? They have the best sort of bleeding edge support for many of the features that are coming out. So Rust, Go, JavaScript, and TypeScript. Uh, and so they're, they're great places to start. Oh, let's, let's go check on that uh, backstage plugin build now. Hopefully, hopefully it's done. OK, so the back, st uh, the back end plugin build is finished. And so let's, we'll hop over to Backstage itself, the, in, the local install, and I'll show you uh, the files that have changed. OK, so a bunch more files have changed, right, for the back end, for the back end plugin. There's a little bit more integration work required for a back end plugin versus a front end plugin. Um, but a lot of the changes are, are you know, somewhat similar. You've, you've added, maybe removed, you know, modified some dependencies. Uh, you've got the index um, for the back, because that backstage itself needs to be modified, right? So inside the back end uh, sort of code tree, you have index.ts. Uh, the TypeScript has to be changed. And then you've got a new plugin, right, which is the example back end in this case. Uh, and then there's another little sort of integration file. But in general, it's really easy to, to sort of track this with source control and, and know what's changing when you run this, uh, when you run this and install something. So we're going to start the uh, backstage instance here, uh, and then I'll do you know a web request or two to show you show you show show that it works. Okay, and we will not need this, uh, this tab it just opened up because we're just going to curl. There we go. 
All right, so here's that demo. Uh, okay, so I, I'm sure everyone's probably familiar with this, but uh, backstage plugins, for example, my, the plugin that I created is called example backend, right? That was in the CLI uh, command. And it's running, you know, uh, via backstage, but on port 7007, right? So we're going to hit that endpoint, that get endpoint that we, de we defined, uh, and see if we can, uh, if we can get it to, uh, to show up. All right, and that's, that's it. So, oh, I, I'll take the clap. Thank you. <laughs> so trying to get into what this is doing uh, would take a long time, so I'm just going to try and breeze through it. But basically what happens is at the back end, you build a WebAssembly binary. That binary um, is self-describing in that it's, it says that it knows how to serve an HTTP request. Now, what happens is we take that binary, turn it into JavaScript, so actually go back from sort of binary code, right, instructions, to JavaScript code, and then run that, run that sort of piece as a server and proxy through Backstage to get to that running server, right? So it, it's a bit complex, but the thing is the tooling for this has evolved to a point where it's still a little sharper on the edges, but it's, it's quite amazing. Um, what we can do with performance and like being with performance, you know, not being lost completely and uh, quite well isolated, and, and uh, also with with high ability to self-describe and sort of be auditable. So I'll jump back in here. That'll be the last demo. There. Let me see. Okay. So yeah, at this point, you can build front-end plugins. You can build uh, back-end plugins. Uh, before, before I close up, I want to just note um, sort of who's building this, right? Uh, this is obviously not just one person or one company or just a couple companies, right? There's a, there's a huge uh, sort of group behind this, uh, and it's headed and stewarded by the Bytecode Alliance. Uh, so you can, and again, they work in the open. Everyone's on Zlib. You can, you can sort of chat with people there. Um, but this is this is they, they sort of move the move the uh, the state of the art forward in this in this space. Uh, I stole this slide from a coworker named Bailey, um, who works also with me at Cosmonic here. And this is these are just some of the faces that sort of work on this tech and sort of you know write the compilers and write the debuggers and write the tests. There are tests uh, and lots of tests actually. Uh, and this is, you know, maybe not even a tenth of the people who, who have actually contributed over the years. It's just, you know, some of the people who are working on some of the, the biggest chunks of it. Uh, a special shout out to the Jayco maintainers. Uh, Guy Bedford is actually in here uh, at the bottom left. He's sort of second from the bottom left there. Um, but a lot of how this works, that, that bit that takes the binary, turns it back into JavaScript. For, and again, that binary could be anything, right? Turns that back into JavaScript and makes it executable from a JavaScript context, backstage in this case, um, is Jayco, right? So this is basically me just reusing their work, uh, mostly. Uh, and so, so a big shout out to them. Uh, they do great work. Uh, and just before I, before I leave here, I want to, want to know uh, why we as, as Cosmonic care about Backstage uh, and why we think it's a good fit uh, for us. And, and we think that it's a good fit because in general, if we can build in Backstage support and Backstage helps teams and ops teams, both dev and ops teams, move faster, um, then as a whole we can ship faster and, and build more things that hopefully at some point helps some users. Uh, so we as a company love Backstage and we're really looking forward to playing more in the ecosystem and and doing more to improve, uh, to improve our support and uh, supporting the ecosystem. Thanks for listening. Uh, here's where you can find the code. If you're very young, look on the, look on the left. You can scan that. Uh, and if you'd like to type, you can type in the thing on the right. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. I guess we have time for one very quick question. Who's the lucky owner? Was there a hand? Oh. Yes. Uh, no. <laughs> I knew I can always count on you. Uh, <laughs> Sorry? Yes, yes, you can. Yes, you can very quickly. Yeah, thank you. 
So, uh, I'll try to be very quick, I uh, love WebAssembly. I think we're leaving the idea of dynamic link, dy dy dynamically linked libraries for uh, ECMAScript is a great idea. And I love what you showed for the back, uh, backend component. That totally works for me. I completely don't get the frontend part. So for me, uh, what you did is basically you've uh, put the TSX files into the uh, binary resource section and then export them to, to make them, to build them through the YARN. So you could as well zip them. So why, why to do that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, and you're right. So the uh, WebAssembly in, for the front end part is a, is a little less useful uh, just because of how, um, how the integration we're using or right now have, we have it designed works. But what you can't do with the zip file is sort of ask a zip file what dependencies it has, right? So like you can maybe you stuff a package.json in there, right? And, um, you know, maybe you like come up with something to read that and then change, you know, backstage at runtime or whenever you're installing it. Um, but the problem is you also can't verify the instructions um, that just sort of produce that, right? So like, take a zip bomb. No, you're, you're out of luck now. So it's like uh, there's it, it's a it's a slightly better um, uh, packaging mechanism, and it gives you a little bit more leverage than just a, a regular zip file or you know just npm install would give you, um, and what we, we, we think there's actually a better way to, or, or sort of a more integrated way to, to put these together um, and actually try and expose the render functions, right? So I, I, alluded, this to, to, this to, uh, I alluded to this a little bit, but ideally we, we put out a contract that actually gives you just HTML back, right? But then you have to do things like, you know, model React state machine and like, you know, there's, there's a lot there, but we, we think that's possible. I mean, it's definitely possible, it's just a matter of, Yes, yes, no, it could absolutely work on the GSX level. And again, this is all web technology, so it's, it's there, but it's, 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 not, uh, it's not easy. It's not, it's not an easy V1, so that, that's why we haven't uh, gone that far yet. Yeah, thank you, great, great question. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, yes, another thank round you. of applause. Thank you. Thank you.